From the Podcast Detroit studios and Zoom everywhere else, the making of champions. Professional boxers inspiring amateur athletes to become champions. Presented by Joe Lewis, champion of them all, Bourbon, in association with USA Boxing, Golden Gloves of America, and BigFightWeekend.com. Join your hosts, Tanya Cole and Marquise Johns, with special guests from around the world of amateur and pro boxing, celebrating the legacy of Joe Lewis, whose status as the first African-American national hero showed the importance of being a leader and a role model inside and outside of the ring. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this um, evening's episode of Making of Champions. With me, I've got Marquise Johns from Big Fight Weekend. How are you doing? Pretty good, Tanya. How are you doing this great day? Doing good. You realize that episode four was our very first episode together. I think it was back on July 30th. So it's been about that long since we've been together. Um, we also have with us tonight um, Marquise Johns from the Big Fight Weekend. So How welcome, you, welcome. So glad to How have you. you. How are you guys doing today? Pretty good to be on you guys. Fightweekend.com is the boxing website I usually have for, I write for published news, boxing news, past, present, and future. Uh, pretty much doing everything revolving around the world of boxing, pretty much keeping up with updates of upcoming fights, upcoming events, past events, historic events, anything, anything boxing related. I'm usually keeping up with it and I'm keeping up with it on there at bigfightweekend.com. Uh, uh, Marquis, so I understand you are going to be my new co-host. That's right. For better or for worse, Tanya, I am the new guy. That's right. Hi, and we've covered a lot in terms of uh, talking to boxers, what they're up to and sort of um, what they're thinking. What are you thinking about the show thus far? Uh, so far, Tanya, I've realized, realizing what we going to show what you just talked to me and your fighters in their process of how they're becoming champions is the drive of what these fighters are coming up to and what they strive to be. Hey, Marquise, you're cracking up a little bit out there. What's going on? Yeah, sorry about that, Tanya. I'm currently on the location for the time that you is recording. Uh, bear with me as I try to uh, explain what's going on my end. Are you anywhere near dinner out there? Uh, no dinner, but there may be a coyote or two, but I, I, I am remote. I hear you. Good to have you. A lot of these fires, for example, when we had on the first guest we had on when I was on the show, David Perez, he mentioned on his end the, the endless work effort that he's putting in. And the thing that just, you know, it's a pattern for all the fires that we've had on is that their drive is relentless and nonstop of trying to become a champion. <laughs> was David's first fight in his pro debut against Gabriel Taku, which he won in a four-round uh, unanimous decision. Uh, walk me back to that, because the clip didn't show this, but I want to catch this as well, because you you caught him, David, with an overhand right twice. Once it was ruled a slip, I mean, he, he was you caught him. Uh, so, walk me back to your, your, back to your pro debut. How, how'd you feel about it? Uh, you know what? I felt really great about it. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was like a, just another feeling especially just coming out like the atmosphere having everyone out there like yeah I mean, a little bit you know a little nervous but not not to fight just for the people there because it's a, a big crowd but uh I felt great I felt like you know I started off trying to figure them out the first round as the rounds picked up I started getting this timing better and uh I just started seeing more places for that right hand and uh like I said the second time I dropped them it was just like a is game over you know I really tried getting them out of there the guy was real strong so, uh, you know, I just think he had a good chin. And he was, you know, as soon as most people, whenever they fall, you know, they come, they get back up. And it's just like, they're not even trying to win anymore. How did you yeah. know? How did you know? Because I've read that you've always had your eye on being a professional boxer. But how did you know that this was the path you wanted to take? I don't know. If, you know, like I was going to say, um, when I first started boxing, it was a hobby. I liked it. It was, it was cool. You know, I liked the fight. So I really enjoyed just competing. It was just like any other kid that wanted to, you know, do a sport and be competitive. But I want to say about the third slash fourth year, I got to go to my first national championship. I went to, I won state Golden Gloves and I went to regionals and beat the best kid at region regionals. And uh, then I got to find out that 
you know, the United States U.S. boxing actually pays for your trip and you win to go to nationals. So I got to spend a whole week in Salt Lake City um, boxing with the best guys in the country. I had to choose that over walking at graduation, but to me, this was more important because I loved what I, what I do, you know, what I did, what I do still. So um, after I came back from that trip, I started to notice because when I was out there, I got to see the level of opposition there. I was like, you know, normal fights are cool, you know, regionals was great, but nationals, you really get to see the people that can fight. You're not watching people that think they can fight, you're watching the real deal. So when I got out there and got exposed to the whole new levels of opposition that I was out there with, I was like, okay, I gotta step it up. This was like a very big uh, realization. Like I was realizing a lot whenever I came back and I was like probably 18 years old at the time. And I was like, okay, I, I made a switch. I started taking boxing more serious. And next thing you know, stuff started to click. I wasn't just that strong, come forward brawler. I was actually getting technical. I was learning how to, you know, slip, how to move. And like, I'm very, um, I have a very good movement. I use my feet a lot. I got good, great footwork. So when all that stuff started to click, I was like, oh, I can do something with this. I've noticed that too. And uh, anywhere from where dad is Superman and to where mom is their heart, but she doesn't take any stuff. Um, the one thing I've noticed about the boxers too is while they all have experienced some sort of hardship to one degree or another, you never really hear them talk about challenge or adversity. They just do. Like starting with Clay Collard, what did you think about his interview? The one thing I love about Clay Collard in his interview that we had with us is the, the ability that he mentioned about he was trying to trying to get out of doing what he was doing before. He mentioned to us on the on the on the, on the show that he was pretty much working at a car wash and wanted to just going to fight for a living, and that's he he made this a, a career profession. Uh, I'm just a heck of a lot tougher, man. That's that's what yeah. I bring, bro. I'm just yeah. gonna last I would gather to say that you are a heck of a lot tougher, um, and given that you are doing things that, as you would say, nobody could have ever done before. And given that everything that you've gone through, can you tell us a little bit about, since we're right now, you've alluded to the pandemic and kind of what's happening um, with that. Can you tell us about your own story of homelessness, how you grew in strength from that situation to kind of where you are now? Because right now, people are looking at you as the 2020 boxer of the year. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey for you? Um, yeah, for sure. I, um, it, it was during the time I was signed with the UFC, just kind of my, my personal life was kind of went to shit. Pardon my language, but, yeah. um, yeah, it just went to crap, man. And, um, uh, I, I mean, I had places to go. I could have moved back home and I could have moved, you know, and back in with the parents and, and got a job and tried to get on my feet that way. But uh, I wanted to fight, man. This is my dream. This is what I want to do. So mm -hmm. I, I chose to stay back and and keep training at, at the gym. And, and I didn't have somewhere to stay, so I stayed in my van. Um, that, that was mainly by choice. You know, I always had somewhere I could go. Mm -hmm. But uh, it just th – th this, is, this is my dream, you know. This is this is what I love doing. If if you watch me fight, you'll understand. Like I love fighting. You know? Yes, I love it. Everything about it. So, um, yeah, just my personal life wasn't going too well, and and, and I wanted to, to fight, and I was trying to fight, and it eventually got too tough, and I had to I had to take a break, and I did move back home, you know, with mom and dad. So, um, after. Uh, about two years there, I just had enough and, and had to get back to what I, I love doing, and that's fighting. So, um, you know, I'm, I moved out, and, and I, I got a motorhome, and I was staying in a motorhome, and that was until I met uh, my coach. I actually moved a couple times, moved in with a friend of mine and, and got a job at a car wash, like I said, and I uh, uh, was just trying to train the whole time, but it didn't really start changing until, until I met my coach now. And, and 
Um, he was just willing to take me in and take me on as a fighter and, you know, let's do this together. And that's what we've done. So um, it was just work, hard work, man. Hard work and dedication. I, I finally made up my mind. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to fight and I'm going to give it everything I have and, and win, lose, or draw, you know? And so, yeah. And I think the words that sort of come to mind for me were um, diversification, you know, that flexibility, as well as adaptability. Um, he even yes. had his match um, having had food poisoning right before getting into the ring. Um, so that truly is a story of being a champion and where he talks about um, the people that are closest to him, his coach, how his coach is family and how he's developed that trust with the coach and with his family over the course of his, uh, I think, 18 fights. And, uh, uh, what about Greg Vendetti? Soon you're getting uh, this, uh, this chance at a title uh, uh, on, main, on national television. Uh, tell me how you feel about it. Uh, I mean, how would anyone feel about it? I'm excited, man. I'm real pumped. And, uh, it just seems like it's meant to be because this was somebody that my trainer, uh, Joe Ricciardi, predicted that I was going to get this fight maybe about three years ago. And I, I, I'm not even lying. And then when he got the call, he called me screaming, saying, I told you, I told you. And then, I, you know, what happened? He's like, hey, they called us. They want to see if they want to fight Lara, blah, 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 whatever. And uh, I, he literally called it about two or three years ago. So, I, I don't know, I kind of took it as a sign. So I'm real excited. Had a great camp, ready to go. So he basically said, you know, just call me Nostradamus. But he also, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. He also said about a year ago that you're not doing this fight to prove anything to yourself that you're doing this to prove something to the world. And what are you trying to prove to the world? Well, I mean, that's, that's that, I'm, that I'm legit. You know, I mean, I feel having this fight with Lara and of course wanting to win, but just the idea is to do my best. And uh, I feel that will, uh, that will earn me a seat at the table of legitimacy just in the, in the, in, in front of the boxing gods, you know, it was, it was, you know, it will solidify my my legitimacy as an actual, real, world class professional fighter. Unfortunately, he came up short in this contest against Irvine Laura. Right, figured it's probably better for me to make a video, let everyone know I'm all right. Uh, what can you do? You know, I knew what I was getting into. It was uh. He was real good. He's one of the best of our generation. So, did my best. Won a few rounds, you know, went bad, landed some punches. Um, that's about it. So, everybody, thank you. I mean, the support's crazy. You know, words can't describe it. Um, all the love and appreciation it's, uh, means the world to me, really does. So, but, uh, yeah, I got a few more left in me, so. It's amazing that his story is that he just does everything outside of boxing that he wants to keep it into, and he plans on going afterwards as well. Yeah, I know. He comes to us as the um, eldest boxer out of the group. I won't say senior because he's still younger than I am. At uh, 30 years of age and with uh, 24 wins, he talks about the notions of uh, being underestimated. As far as where the resilience comes from, um, I think that just is my life and going back to my childhood and everything. Like I, you know, I always felt, uh, I was everyone. I, not even myself. If I feel like the, no one expected much from me. You know what I mean? It was always, you know, almost have like a born to lose kind of aura around me from everyone else, not myself, but, uh, so I've, I've always had, this has never been easy for me, like ever, you know, day one, I was, you know, if you could see me where I started, you would be, it was laughable, you know, it wasn't anything special at all. My late cousin who, who uh, used to train me before my dad, um, you know, he always, he, he was the one to really instill faith in me, you know, he was a good, a, a good man, nice church man. All right, so we're back with the Making of Champions. Um, Marquise. Tell us a little bit about Lamont Roach Jr. He's the only boxer that has come to us without a nickname. 
his desire was to fight pretty much for his mom, which I thought was very amazing because he was going to work on the show Boxing Moms, which we were trying to work on as well for us. Uh, he also brought up a couple of points that a couple of other boxers brought up as well. Um, dedication and hard work being the tenets behind his boxing ethic. Um, the one thing he did mention about his father is that uh, dad is Superman to him. And not just because of his strength or his power, his dedication to him as a son. He said, it's not only for what he does for me, but what he does for others that makes it important to him. That, um, your father is definitely part of this and, and he has stepped in and played a fundamental role in your training. And I also noticed that on Father's Day, you put, you, know, you made, three back-to-back -back posts about fathers. What has your father's influence been on you? And um, how has that been influential in terms of you being the champion that you are today? Uh, well, my dad's a hell of an influence on me. He's like super, he's like Superman to me. Um, you know, and not only because the things he does for me, but the things he does for others as well. Um, he's not selfish with, you know, any of his knowledge, his love and his care. Um, because most of my friends, most of my friends that I grew up with and that, that I have today, they don't have fathers. I can I can really count on my hands how many of my friends have their father in their life or have uh, both of their parents in their life. You know, I'm, I'm blessed um, to have that in my life and not only just my you know just my friends but my family as well like um some of my cousins and stuff like that you know they don't come from the same household we have they have their fathers they definitely have their fathers but they don't come from a complete like home like me and you know that's how i know i kind of know what it feels like you know to to share that experience through all my friends because i grew up with them day in and day out sleeping over the house um you know i talk to them every day and stuff like that when they come over our house you know my dad is like stepping in or not not stepping in but that's how they look at him as you know a father figure so my my dad man he, he's amazing he's taking back over this fight oh big shot from lamont roach hurts jamel harry with just five seconds left here in the 11th round um, he's also one of our boxers that comes in under the top 25 under 25. Legacy, that notion of legacy, is always uh, very important to Lamont as well. Yes, and then our, our last boxer, um, Malik Hawkins, before he turned to Rose, uh, that was a very interesting story in that he faced death and skirted death, not only um, as a young, young child, but as an adult. And when people make that reference to being on death's door, well, death actually met him on his door. And the one story that I can, you know, spit back out to you about Malik is confidence, confidence, confidence. So speaking of being destined to be great, I'm going to take you back a few years. You said just a week ago um, that I was run over and almost killed by a car at age five. My older brother murdered at age six and watching all of my OGs die off over the years. First time being arrested at 14, multiple arrests from 15 to 17, but I'm still standing and I'm destined to be great. Tell mm -hmm. us about growing up in Baltimore. Oh, growing up in Baltimore, it's, it's crazy. It's kind of, it's, it's real crazy and everything like that. And, um, you know, you, you see everything at an early age, you know, you see drugs, you know, murders. You know, young kids, some young kids, you know, hustling now, you know, it's, it's just crazy, you know, and, and it's just so happened that I, I went through everything. I seen everything from people getting killed on my doorstep and everything and through people that I, that I looked up to and I cared deeply about going to jail or, or getting murdered in the streets. I just so happened that I, I made it out. I made it through it and I survived it. How did you do that? Because you said you were born doing this. How did you make it through? I mean, I was, you know, having the right people around me, you know, having good, you know, good, strong men around me, good, like a strong, especially a strong mother, you know, that, that didn't take no slack from me no matter what. 
and um, just you know, basically just having a, a lot of good people around me, the people that that genuinely care about me, not just looking for a handout. Can you that's tell us a little bit more about your mother? Oh, my mom! That's my heart right there. That's my <laughs> that's my OG. That's my everything. Uh, she sometimes she might she may get a little crazy on me sometimes, but yeah, I, I love my mother to death. Um, but. My mother, she just so strong. She's just a, a real strong black woman, everything like that. And, you know, her raising, you know, three kids by herself. You know, I still have my father in my life, but me living with but me living with my mother and everything. And her just going to getting up, going to work, going to work every day, days she don't feel like it. Her back, her back might hurt some days, her feet might hurt some days. And she's and by her still being able to do it and with me getting in trouble and everything, she still she stuck by me. Then not just uh not too long ago, she came down with um she had the coronavirus and everything like that. And she did she didn't give up. You know, even though it was it was some points, you know, that she wanted to, but she she stood strong, like like the black woman, the strong black woman she is, and she made it through. And at this point, that movie does have in spades. And he's in action next month. I think that's Theo Matias. And one thing you mentioned to us on the show that I thought was very interesting as well is that he can fight either style that he chooses. And it doesn't matter which way he wants to do it, but he wants to do it and win. Right. And he talked about his mom, too. And he said, you know, my mom is my heart, my OG, my driving force and support. A strong black woman that doesn't take any slack. That um, your wife Taryn posted on, I think it was April 1st, um, about her role as a first responder um, during this pandemic. Yes. And how there um, was a period of time that you spent um, apart um, yes. for both her and Walker. Um, that was in so inspiring to read that post. Um, one question that she posed to all of us on her post was, what is your why? So if you can kind of take us back a little bit and tell us what was going on in your life during that time. I don't know if it still is going on, but tell us about that time. And then yeah. tell us, what is your why? So Taryn is, um, uh, she's a nurse in a hospital here in St. Francis. And when obviously the coronavirus first started, we were just terrified. So we luckily have a little trailer out by the lake here. So Walker and I, we just um, we just said, all right let's go. And we went out there and we stayed at the lake and Taryn would actually, uh, once a week come, she'd tr stop at the side of the road and she'd drop groceries and she'd sit and watch us bringing in the groceries. We wouldn't talk. And we just thought it was better on Walker that she, uh, that he didn't see her in person just cause he's two and a half and it's so hard. He'd want to hug his mom. So, uh, we did, you know, uh, Skype and FaceTime and all, all that stuff. So, so yeah, it was, it was rough. It was hard. And then as things progressed um, and things got better at the hospital, um, we slowly transitioned back in, but we still take uh, huge precautions. Um, she's still, you know, there's still Corona patients that do come in here and there. So, so we have to be careful. So what about that sort of uh, overcoming in terms of the golden gloves. Wasn't that an amazing story? That was too. The fact that she just signed up for it was on her first try and pretty much made it to the finals for the first girl and it's something that is pretty amazing. I think that also is a great story also. That's right. I know that's one thing that um, Leek also talked about too was destiny. So I think um, Rose's win in the ring um, was certainly destiny for her as well. And also with Rose, the one thing that she did mention is that for her it was God's plan. So whatever she puts her mind to it, Jesus uh, got to take the wheel and drive her to be whatever that, that she can become. Absolutely, absolutely. The, are you talking about the Golden Gloves? Yes. Okay, listen, bro. Listen, this is crazy. This is crazy. So I'm at the gym. I'm training. And my coach is like, you're eligible for the Golden Gloves. Let's put you in. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. Bearing in mind, I've had zero fights, right? I've never had a fight in my life. Okay. So he puts me in. There's no one in Oklahoma, Kansas, or whatever that I have to fight. So I go straight to the National Golden Gloves <laughs> tournament with zero fights. Oh, geez. So I'm sitting, I'm around these world-class athletes, these USA boxers yeah. at the National, you know, and you're talking about these, these, um, 
northeast states and stuff, they're they're doing the qualifications for that for three weeks. Yeah. Long, long qualifications, tough. And I'm at the Golden Gloves with no fights, right? <sighs> Crazy. So my first fight in the super heavyweight division, I was um, I, it was straight into the semifinals. I fought this girl from Hawaii. Yeah, bam, yeah. bam, bam. Stopped her. Should have been stopped earlier. Put her away. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I'm into the finals. <laughs> and I'm just like, how can I be in the finals of the National Golden Gloves tournament, right? Yeah. But it's funny because there was a basketball player who was on the USA team that I saw. And I'm fighting this girl that's a USA boxer, right, in the finals. This big girl. She's experienced. But I'm talking to my friend who used to be a basketball player, and I'm like, listen, I hadn't had any fights before I came here. And she kind of laughed at me, right? Yeah. She like was like, oh, my gosh, she's an experienced boxer. So I kind of watch them, and I see her go speak to the girl that I'm going to fight. And I saw her roll her eyes, and I'm like, but I told her, I said, y'all don't underestimate me now. Right. So in the finals. And listen, she ends up beating me in the – I'm in the finals of the National Golden Glove Tournament, right? Yeah. Beat my first girl, got to the finals. And I'm just like, and it's crazy because the finals was a whole lot different from the semifinals. You had that one ring that they moved. that was a bunch of rings, the semis. Yeah. You have that one ring, the lights. I was like, oh, I was nervous. Ooh. So I got in there. I started out a little rough, but I knew that I shook her with my power and my strength. And uh, I, had her, I had her on her back foot with a jab. Let me tell you, listen, if I had someone tell me at the gym, they said, I thought y'all, it was, you won it. If I had 30 more seconds, it was pure inexperience. If I had 30 more seconds, this is an experienced USA boxer. I had her on the ropes at the end, turning away from me almost. Oh, and you know, that's no go. That's, no, that's a no-no. So, <laughs> so if, I had, if I had the experience of a couple of fights, like if I was to go right now with her, listen, no wonder they got me on box record number one when I've had hardly any fights because yeah. they know it when they see it. <laughs> I know we've got um, Michelle Rosado, Raging Babe, that's going to be joining us next week. We are heading to Allentown, Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. We are going to go see Tammy Adorno, the mother of Joseph and Jeremy Adorno. Tammy has six kids, two of them being professional fighters. She juggles motherhood. She juggles being a wife. She juggles boxing life. I mean, it's, she has her hands full. They have a really tight bond. I mean, when you see them, you could just see it instantly. You know, those kids started boxing when they were like seven years old. Look at Jeremy, how little! She has an amazing story from what goes on inside the ring, outside the ring, and then with her, her new uh, episode that's coming out with Boxing Moms. Uh, I'm excited to talk to her, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, this evening with the Making of Champions with Podcast Detroit. Um, I've got Marquise John signing out, and this is Tanya Cole. From the Podcast Detroit studios and Zoom everywhere else, the Making of Champions. Professional boxers inspiring amateur athletes to become champions. Presented by Joe Lewis, champion of them all, Bourbon, in association with USA Boxing, Golden Gloves of America, and BigFightWeekend.com. Join your hosts, Tanya Cole and Marquise Johns, with special guests from around the world of amateur and pro boxing, celebrating the legacy of Joe Lewis, whose status as the first African-American national hero showed the importance of being a leader and a role model inside and outside of the ring. 